Thanks for joining us today for today's webinar, How Search Engines Index Your Websites. My name is Arantxa Piperova. I'm a search analyst for search.gov. I would like to go through a couple of things before we get started. We'll take questions at various points in this presentation, and you can type those in the YouTube Live chat box to the right of the video. We are recording today's session, and it will be available immediately on the Digital Gov YouTube channel. You will receive an email immediately after the event with the slides and an event evaluation. Please give us your feedback since it helps us to make sure we are creating content that is worthwhile. I would also like to give a little context for today's event. In this webinar, we will walk you through the fundamentals of how search engines monitor your content and pull relevant data from your pages. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dawn Makalski. She's a professional librarian on a mission to help people find what they're looking for. She's also the program manager for search.gov, where she works to improve customers' experience with the service and public's experience with when searching on government websites. So, Don, please take it away. Thanks, Arantxa. I appreciate that introduction. So, as she mentioned, we are going to talk today about the high-level functionality of a search engine, uh, including how they get monitor your website for content, as Arantxa said, and get the content into their indexes. And then also the role that sitemaps and robots.txt files play in that process. Some special considerations for publish, uh, sites that publish their content on multiple platforms, which is pretty common across government. And then also the relationship between the indexing process and the search process that an end user goes through. So first, what is, what is a search engine? I thought it would be good to start off with some definitions so that we're all on the same page. And basically, uh, so I'll be using the word index a lot. And we all have slightly different understandings of what the word index means. Uh, but basically, it's a pointer. So you have the, um, I'm sorry, one moment. Did that say share your screen? Am I not sharing? OK, we're good. We're good. Um, so, uh, so an index is a pointer to something else. And I was surprised that my, my primary definition of an index is actually the second definition, uh, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. But uh, what we'll be talking about today is a list of items that points you in the direction of the information so that you can get it, uh, get, it get the full content where you need it. So this is, a, this is a page from the index of my copy of Herodotus's histories. And as you know, on a, an index in the back of a book, it shows on what pages that we'll find certain information. So we're going to zoom in on the top portion here. And some indexes show the keyword and then just page numbers. But you'll see this index also shows not only the keyword, but also some context that allows you to make an informed decision about which page you want to turn to to find, to find what you want to look for. So this is an old school search result with snippets. And I was, really, I was really pleased when I found this. So each of these entries shows metadata about the page. Metadata, of course, is data about other data. And in this case, we had information on a page. And then we had that information's topic, subtopic, and the number of the page. And none of this information, none of this is the information on the page. And if we want that, we have to go to read it directly. So this is my very simplified definition of a search engine. And the thing that makes them different from a regular database is that they self-populate. And this can make them appear very magical. But other than the scale and sophistication of results presentation and how information gets into them, using Google isn't all that different from doing a find in all sheets in Excel. So just like the Wizard of Oz, there are people behind the curtain use, uh, using certain technology to make it look like magic, but it's really just technology. So let's draw back that curtain. There are two sides to any search engine, indexing content, which consists of discovering what content is available, 
and building a useful index of that content. And then they also allow queries against the index so that end users can discover the content for themselves. So the top two items here are the indexing side and then the, the bottom is the search. So the two primary ways that search engines discover your content are through crawling and through sitemaps. Crawling is when the search bot opens a page, detects all the links on that page, makes a note of them, and then goes to all of those pages as well. XML sitemaps are machine-friendly lists of the items on a website, and the bot reads the list, notes all of the URLs, and for example, ours is search.gov slash, oh, and we have a resource available on our website about uh, the details that they look for in a sitemap. So both of these, crawling and sitemaps, result in the search engine knowing what exists on your website. One very important thing to note is that Google and Bing have clearly stated that they don't crawl everything. And um, they don't crawl all sites. They don't crawl every part of every site. And that they don't index everything that they crawl through. So there's, there's sort of everything on the web, the subset of that that, that, that gets crawled, and then the subset of that that ends up in the Google index. Google can also discover content via feeds. And you'll see I've got it kind of grayed out. Yes, feeds. Um, I won't cover this method today, but uh, there's a link in the slide notes if you want to learn more about that. So you can indicate whether you want portions of your site indexed or not using robot settings. And we'll talk about these in detail later on. But to mark entire folders as not to be indexed, you want to use your robots.txt file. And yeah. for, for individual files, you can list those in the robots.txt file if you want. Or you can use a robots meta tag in the head of the page. So more on both of these later. So the bot has gone through your site and collected your URLs. Now it's going to parse the data on each of those pages. The bot requests the page, reads the code, and sorts through what's there to see what it can what can be used according to the developers who programmed the bot. So what links are on the page? What text-based content is there? Are there images or other content types? They look to see what's there, they sort it out, map it into their own model, and save the information to their indexes. And that's the actual indexing stage when the parsed data gets saved. So when you're very beautiful home page gets opened up, it's going to look like this to the robot. So as some of you may have heard me say before, computers are really stupid and can only do what they've been told to do. So, well, so far at least. So parsing of content is helped by structure. The more explicit structure you can put into your pages, the easier it will be for the computer to interpret your intent and present good results to searchers. Do you have metadata in tags in your page heads or inline in the tags within the body? I won't talk much about structured, structured markup today, but if you have questions about that, let's follow up afterwards. If you use a content management system, there are plugins that will insert structured markup for you. So also, do you use header tags, the H tags, in your page in the proper way with the page title in H1, H2 containing section headings, and so on down from there. I've seen page titles in H2s, while the site section name is in the H1. And there are plenty of pages still in government that have the title and sections just as bold text in the body. You'll get better results in search if the title of your page is in the H1 tag. And there's only one H1 tag on the page. And lastly, are you using a main element in your body tag? The body tag, of course, includes all the visible stuff on the page, but we don't want headers, footers, and navigation elements indexed along with the main content of a given page. So we wrap that portion of the HTML, HT, that portion of the HTML body in a main tag, or you can give a, a div the role of main. And that lets bot, bots know that anything outside of this is fluff and should be ignored in terms of indexing the content of that particular page. For this, you want to be particularly sure you've implemented properly. 
The other day I was trying to figure out why a particular search result was so hidden for a page we had indexed. And it was because the only thing inside the main element was the H1 tag. So all our system took was the title of the page and we didn't have any of the other important content because it was outside of the main element. So watch out for that. And you'll also be helped getting into the index with high quality content. So the higher quality the content, the better your SEO ranking will be because the search engines will be better able to match searcher needs with your content. So what does high quality content mean? It should be unique to the page. This includes the main content of the page, but also title tags and meta, de meta descriptions in the head. It should be written in plain language using the words your audiences use in addition to whatever technical terms or acronyms you may need to use. And you'll want to go easy on the jargon so that you get all of those terms in, but the primary access point for how the searchers express that interest matches the primary description of that content on your page. And this is really win-win because it'll be easier for the search engine to match your content with searcher needs. And then once they get to the page, they'll be better able to understand it. It should also be well-written. So in the age of Grammarly and other quality checkers, it's no surprise that search engines would start running these kinds of tools over the content in their indexes and scoring pages accordingly. So I know some agencies provide plain language and quality review tools to their staff. So uh, inquire with your web management team if there's something like that available for you. And this applies also, this applies to new pages that you're writing now, but then also to pages that have been published for a while. Never hurts to make something more clear. And then finally, you want to ask if the content is useful. Search engines track what people are looking for and what they click on from results, and they're analyzing what makes a particular item click-worthy. So if a page appears to be redundant or too fluffy or incomprehensible, it shouldn't be too surprising if it doesn't end up getting indexed. I was talking with someone the other day and they said, you know, we have 900,000 items on our website and Google keeps stopping after about 300,000. And given the nature of this particular site, I, couldn't, I wasn't too surprised because it, it could appear to Google as very repetitive content. So let's recap what we've gone over so far. So, and I'll take questions in a minute. So send them in uh, if, you, if you have any in mind. So this is your website. And here's Google over in some other part of the web. Googlebot visits your website to review your sitemap and crawl around. They parse the data, they sort it out, and then they decide what of it they'll bring into their indexes, not every page. And then here comes Allison from Ohio. She wants to get a passport. So she goes to Google and searches for passport application. She gets a bunch of results on Google.com. She clicks on one from travel.state.gov and is brought over to that site to view the information. It's pretty straightforward. Have we gotten any questions so far? No, none so far? Okay, let's move on then. No, no question at this time, Donna. I was just checking. Okay, thank you. So let's talk briefly about crawling. We're not going to talk in depth about crawling today, but you do want to make your site as crawlable as possible. First, you want to make sure that you avoid crawler traps. Crawler traps occur when your site can generate an infinite number of URLs. And this usually happens when any given URL can have parameters appended to it, like tags or referring pages or a Google Tag Manager token and so on. So each one of those URLs will look like a different URL and the crawler will open it and they'll note the links on it, which will then themselves, once followed, have these additional parameters on them and the crawler won't be able to figure out what constitutes the entirety of a website. The most, if not all, search engines will stop working if they detect a crawler trap because they don't want to waste their resources. And I've got a reference in the notes so you can learn more about, about crawler traps. 
You can help avoid crawler traps as well as alleviate other potential confusion over which version of a URL is the version of record by inserting a canonical link in the head of the page. So this particular example here tells the search engine that even though this page can be accessed via https colon slash slash www.agency.gov slash topic one, it, the version without the subdomain and, and without the trailing slash should be the one indexed. And this helps with crawler traps too because it says disregard all those parameters and index just the real URL. And if your site is built with JavaScript, note that even though the search engines can now render your pages to see the content, they're still ignoring anything past a hash sign in the URL because the within page anchor links within page anchor links use a hash sign as well. So you'll want to change it to this format that's uh, known as hash bang. And with, um, or see if you can drop that, the hash symbol entirely from your URLs. I understand it's easier to turn it into a hash bang than to remove it. So take a look at that if you've got hashes and you've been wondering why you, your crawl coverage is, is uh, poor. And then also, if you have uh, if you have a no script tag in your JavaScript display, you know the the text that you want to have in place in case the um, in case someone has JavaScript turned off, you want to want them to know to turn JavaScript on or to have otherwise access to your site. Then uh, take a look inside Google Google Search Console to see whether Googlebot is tripping on that or not. Um, I was looking at a site last week where all Googlebot was seeing was that no script tag. They also had hash in their URLs, so. Don, we do have a question. Okay, go for it. So Joe from NSF is asking, are there meta tags that are no longer paid attention to by Google? There are. So I um, I will talk about that later. And there is a link in the slide notes that is uh, that will send you to the list of meta tags that Google pays attention to. So we'll loop back to that in a bit. All right. That's the only question we have at this point. Thank you. OK, great. Keep them coming, everybody. So with XML sitemaps, let's it's as I said earlier, it's a list of items on a website. And hopefully it will also state when each was last modified. And then it'll also possibly indicate their relative importance one to another. An XML sitemap is not a shopping list for Google of all the things that they should pick up from your site. It's more like a weekly specials flyer saying, here's what we have. Don't you want to come get it? So there's a philosophical debate that is shown there because do you want to include only the most important pages to try to draw attention to them or do you want to include all your stuff? Googlebot will follow its programming to determine whether to index your content. So from their perspective, including only the most important or all is a little bit six of one, half a dozen of the other because they have other determinations that they, that they make as to whether to index something or not. For search.gov, we will take all of your stuff. We don't editorialize for you. So uh, in determining what content should be available for search or not, that's because we have a different mission, which is to make it easier to find things on a particular government website. We're not trying to provide access across the whole web. And because of this, we have a much smaller universe to cover than Google. So we don't have to be as conservative with our index size even though it might sound funny to think about Google's index as being a conservative size. So why do you want an XML sitemap? Because you want to make it easier for bots to discover your content. And it will cut the URL discovery time down significantly. And as a reward for helping them and for showing you can present your content in an organized way, Google gives a bit of a ranking boost, or so it's thought. Most of SEO is just reading tea leaves because, of course, Google doesn't give away their secrets. So 
XML sitemaps, there's a protocol that you're supposed to follow. And it is this. It needs to be an XML format file that is itself the file location listed in the robots.txt file. It needs to include the files for the location where the sitemap file is. It needs to have clean URLs and the date each file was last modified. That is optional, but it's really, really useful. And then totally optional are the file change frequency and the priority. And that's, that's it. It's pretty basic. But each of these is tricky, which is why we're having this session today. So your sitemap might look like this. This is ours from search.gov. And it was generated using a Jekyll tool in GitHub Pages. And it includes just our URLs and the last modified date. Or it might look like this. This was generated by the Drupal XML sitemaps module. You can see the change frequency here and the priority, priority settings over on the far right. And let's look at the elements of the protocol and how they can each go wrong. All right, so XML format file seems pretty straightforward. But there, and yes, that there are some alternative formats mentioned in the protocol, but XML is the standard. So what could go wrong with this? First, it needs an opening XML declaration with the version stated. And you need to close the XML tag. You can infer everything from the advice that I'm giving that I've seen something to the contrary <laughs> in, in, my, uh, in my travels. So if you're using a sitemap generating tool, it should handle this for you. But I have seen sitemaps where the, that were tool generated that were missing these features. So if, take a look to make sure what you've got in place has it. And if you don't do these things, the poor stupid search engine bots won't know what they're looking at. They'll just see a code and they won't be able to interpret it without, without these declarations. It needs to be listed in the robots.txt file. The, and we'll talk in detail about the robots.txt in the next section. But search engines are going to check your robots.txt file first. And the line for the sitemap entry should look exactly like this. One line, and it says sitemap colon space, and then the path of the sitemap. In theory, this means that you could put the sitemap anywhere, but search engines would still find it because it's listed here. So that's true, but it also violates the location element of the protocol, which we'll look at next. You don't want to list the sitemap file as an allow line in your robots.txt. You do want to list multiple sitemaps if you have multiple publishing platforms for a given subdomain, one on each line. So you would have sitemap colon path, and then next line, sitemap colon path. And don't list multiple sitemaps for multiple domains or multiple subdomains on the same robots.txt. More on that later. Before the location where the sitemap is, the sitemap should include files for the location where it is. If a sitemap is at www.agency.gov slash sitemap.xml, then it's only supposed to have URLs for the www subdomain. Blog.agency.gov should have its own sitemap at blog.agency.gov slash sitemap.xml. Similarly, if you put your sitemap in a folder like www.agency.gov slash sitemaps slash sitemaps.xml, according to the protocol, it would only have URLs within that slash sitemaps folder. So you want to also include the URLs that you want indexed from that location. For us, search.gov, please list all of your URLs that you want us to index, as many as you can include in a sitemap, at least for the stage where we're seeding your index at the very startup indexing. For commercial in engines, it's your call, especially if you're happy with your crawl coverage in that most important or everything debate that I was talking about earlier. But for sure, don't include URLs from folders that you've excluded from indexing on your robots.txt file. And we can, we'll talk more about that later. Clean URLs. 
If you're using a content management system and a plugin to generate your sitemap, this should be taken care of you, care of for you. It should be. But first, just to go over the essentials so that you can double check that it's working right, the file needs to be UTF-8 encoded. And you need to declare it as such in your, oops, in your opening XML declaration. Any special characters you have in your URLs need to be encoded using standard HTML encoding. And the protocol of the URLs in the sitemap needs to match the protocol of the site itself. This comes up a lot if the sitemap was created before the site moved to HTTPS. So the sitemap file is HTTPS. The pages on the site are HTTPS. But the pages as listed on the sitemap are still HTTP. This makes double work for the search engine because even though your 301 redirect might be getting the user to the right place, the search engine will create a record for the HTTP, HTTP version and then have to update it right away to the HTTPS version. Same goes for any URL on your sitemap that redirects to another URL. So just to keep the resource load down for the search engines, uh, please don't rely on redirects to take care of inaccuracies in your sitemap. And then finally, if you have a content management system, it's likely you have directory landing pages that are accessible via agency.gov slash section slash index.html, and then also agency.gov slash section slash, and agency.gov slash section. Each of these pages might show the same Excuse me, each of these URLs might show the same page, but they'll be seen as bots as different URLs because they're dumb. So this is the time to decide which version is the preferred version. And then you list that as the canonical URL in the head of the page, which I mentioned earlier, and also set that version to be the one to be included in the sitemap. If your system stores a date for when pages were last edited, do include it on the sitemap in, in a last mod field. It'll indicate to the bot if there's any work to be done on that item since the last time it came to the site. And then it can also be used in search and filtering of results if you don't have publication dates in your page metadata. If you don't include it, it'll be harder for the search engine to pick up updates to the pages. And then what happens is we get desperate calls about a leadership bio page that is still showing the name and information about the person who had a very public departure the previous week. And so if you're indexed with our system, we can manually trigger uh, the new page to be updated and the old page to be re uh, removed. If you're talking about the commercial search engines, uh, you, you can request it, but you're at their mercy as well. Change frequency isn't really used anymore, mostly because people are people and tried to game the system by saying that the page updated daily, but there wouldn't be any actual changes to the page for months and months. So most search engines are ignoring this, uh, this field. So don't worry about adding change frequency, but focus on the last mod date. And then priority is marginally useful. So because Google and Bing are comparing the content across many, many sites when they're compiling a list of search results for a given query, knowing that one page on a site is more important than another page on that same site isn't all that helpful for their search algorithm. For them, high quality content will be more useful as you compete with other sites for ranking. And in terms of what I was mentioning earlier about well-written, using the language that your researchers use, there are ways that you can make sure to incorporate all the different ways that they might talk about it without um, doing something as blatant as keyword stuffing. Uh, basically, you want to integrate those keywords down into the content of your page, into your link text to the page, all of those kinds of things. For search.gov, because when you're writing for Google or Bing, when you're writing for your public and they're indexing you and you're getting searched through Google or Bing, you're competing, is from their perspective, you're competing with other sites for position in those search results. But so for, for search.gov, we are thinking about using this field because since we're just looking for search results within one domain, usually, sometimes we have many, but usually just one, 
knowing the relative importance of pages would actually be very informative to us so that we could weight those accordingly. So if you've got it, don't take it out. Uh, but you also don't need to worry about adding it if you don't have it. So there are a couple of more considerations about sitemaps. And uh, the Google and Bing got together and decided that there should be a maximum size for a given sitemap, which makes sense because they're, again, being conservative with their resource use. And in the last year or two, they decided to raise the maximum size to either 50,000 URLs or 50 megabytes whichever comes first. And anything bigger than this is going to need to use multiple sitemaps, which will be listed on a sitemap index file. Most government websites are very, very large, so this probably applies to your site. The sitemap index should meet all the same standards as an individual sitemap, particularly in that it should be location specific and the URLs on it need to be clean. And in the slide notes, I've got uh, links to that for you. Here's an example. You can see that we've got this of a sitemap index. So we've got an opening de XML de declaration. And in, after that, instead of a URL set tag, we have a sitemap index tag. And then instead of a URL tag within that, we have a sitemap tag. So here comes a sitemap. Here's the location of the sitemap. Here's the last time this sitemap was updated. This is the end of the information about that sitemap. Here comes another sitemap, et cetera. So just like any protocol, it's only as good so far as people are willing to enforce it. You know, manners make the world go round, except maybe not. So. Google was one of the groups behind the sitemap protocol, but they also do accept sitemaps in Google Search Console that don't follow the protocol, particularly around whether the sitemap is at the root of the section that it represents. There are humans behind every bot, and there are humans behind every website, so there's going to be messiness. And here are some of the things that we have seen. Sitemaps hidden away in totally obscure subfolders. Sitemaps on one domain with URLs for different domains or subdomains, like totally other do domains. URLs listed multiple, multiple times the same URL on the same sitemap. URLs with spaces in them. URLs that are for staging environments or relative URLs or local dev computer URLs on the publicly published sitemap. URLs with ports declared, so agency.gov colon 443. Uh, URLs missing file extensions where they're needed. And if you click on something, it goes to a 404. But if you add a file extension, it will work. And also, this was my personal favorite, URLs beginning HTTPS colon slash. <laughs> so don't let this happen to you. And please don't do this to anybody else. <laughs> so um, do, we have, do we have any questions at this time? Not at this time, Don. OK, thank you very much. All right, so let's, let's dive into the robots.txt. So what is a robots.txt file? It's a signal to bots of what you want indexed and what you don't want indexed, as well as of the posted speed limit for the requests to the site. This file is not a setting that can actually control bots. Bots have, that have been programmed with bad manners will in, ignore your requests entirely and attempt to go all over your site as fast as, you, as they can. So you'll want to make good use of your firewall to shut things down if the requests go over your rate limit. And you really need to keep, if you really need to keep bots out of a particular area of your site, you need to put that behind authentication. So why would you have one then? Bots programmed with good manners will follow your settings. And Google, Bing, search.gov, the Internet Archive will all definitely follow your robots.txt settings. Because of this, you can mostly control what will appear in the Google index, and you can totally control what appears in search.gov. 
The robot's exclusion protocol was first published in 1994 because all the way back then there was a clear need to control bots that people were sending out to other people's websites. And there are two ways that you can use it. You can place a robots.txt file at the root of your domain, or you can put a robots meta tag in the head of a given page. This is the entirety of the formal protocol. There are only two field types, user agent, specifying which bots you're targeting with particular commands, and disallow, saying what you want bots to stay out of. And then also you can add comments following a little uh, hash sign. There are a few other fields that have become standardized, though they're not part of the official standard. Crawl delay is your posted speed limit. And the number here is the number of seconds in between requests by the bot. Allow is the opposite of disallow and is helpful to allow a particular bot in a location where you want others to stay out or to add an exception for a file in a folder that you've disallowed. And then sitemap, of course, we talked about earlier. A note about crawl delay. So this applies to all requests, whether the bot is actually crawling your site or requesting pages on your sitemap. 10 is what I've seen the most common crawl delay. And I think it must be the default in some content management systems. But if your site is really big, though, it can have a huge impact on the crawl of your site. And it's basic math. If you've got 500,000 pages and a 10-second crawl delay, it would take almost 58 days to get through the whole site just one time. So take a, take a, take a look at what you've got. Do some math against your content. Uh, again, Google and Bing don't crawl the entirety of sites. They don't, they don't promise to. We do, though. So, um, so it's something to consider. We've been, uh, to get around this, we've been requesting that sites let us work in their environment more rapidly than the other bots. So you can add different settings for different bots like this. So you would say user agent, USA search, crawl delay two, and user agent, anybody else, crawl delay 10. I mentioned that you can place robots, uh, robots tags in the page level in the head. This is done through a meta tag, and you can tell a bot to not index the page or follow the links on the page. Or you could tell it to follow links but not index the page, or to index it but to not follow the links. And so that's what these, they're basically, the default is index and follow. And so there are three alternatives that you might set in the head of the page. No index, no follow. No index, follow. Index, no follow. No index follow is a really great setting to put on your content index pages, like for a given tag or list, <clears throat> where the items on the list would be good search results, but the list itself wouldn't be that helpful as a result. And there are also some additional meta tags that Google pays attention to. This is what um, the question about earlier was about. So um, the reference for that is uh, goes along with this page. All right, what could go wrong? Again, mind the slash. You need to be really careful with your slashes because especially in robots, they have different meanings at different levels. So here we've got disallow slash, disallow a path, slash, no slash, and disallow a path with a slash on the end. So this first one means don't index anything at all. The second one says, don't index anything at all within this folder. And then this third one says, OK, well, you could, inv you could do topic1.html or topic1.whatever other file extension you have, but not anything lower below the slash. So be careful. As I said, we will pay attention to this <laughs> in our indexing. And then another way you need to be careful with the slashes is whether you're allowing everything or disallowing everything. Adding just a slash means everything, 
and leaving it blank means nothing. So this top set disallow slash is the same as allow blank. So disallow everything, allow nothing is this top set. Or disallow nothing, allow everything means it's totally open. We've had people accidentally block indexing to their whole site thinking that they were allowing indexing to their whole site. All right, more pitfalls. Please try not to be sloppy. I won't, I, you know, we all do our best, but try hard. And also don't get creative. As I mentioned, the computers are dumb and they won't be able to infer what you're talking about. So be sure to follow the field names that are in the protocol and watch your, um, your spaces and your colons and, and all of that. Have we gotten any questions in so far about robots? No, okay. All right, so what about multiple publishing platforms? Simply put, you wanna follow the protocols. So each system's subdomain will have its own robots.txt and its own sitemap.xml or sitemap index. And if you use different publishing platforms, get as much of it automated as you possibly can. So you wanna use a sitemap generator. So Drupal has a module um, that's sort of more or less standard. Yoast has a WordPress plugin and a Drupal module that you could look at. Static sites have tools as well, like the Jekyll sitemap gem we use on GitHub pages to make ours. And then if you have to, you could generate a sitemap manually using your SEO tool. They're, after they crawl your site, they'll usually, they, most of them are able to display what they found in the format of an XML sitemap, which you can then save and post to the web ser server, and then just lather, rinse, repeat on that as often as you want to have your sitemap updated. And then if you don't have a, if you don't have a content management system, but you have a publication log or other inventory that you keep updated as you, as you push things out, you might be able to write a script that would generate a sitemap when new entries appear in that log. So that's something to think about. Some sites have multiple systems supporting the same subdomain. So the main site has migrated to Drupal, but there are a bunch of folders that are still static and they will be for the foreseeable future. So each, each system should have its own sitemap and it would be placed at the root for that system. So you might have one at agency.gov slash sitemap.xml and then you might have another one at agency.gov slash subtopic a slash sitemap.xml and the last one at agency.gov slash subtopic b dot slash sitemap.xml and then you would list all of those three in the robots.txt file for the domain one per line like we were talking about earlier. So what's the relationship between sitemaps and search? So this question is why I wanted to do this session. I've gotten a lot of questions asking how, in search.gov, how does the sitemap control the search? And as we've established, sitemaps support the indexing side of search engines. And then people querying the search engine is a, actually a totally separate process. So let's go back to the pictures we were using earlier. So now instead of Google, the search engine is search.gov. And in between here, this is the search.gov admin center where you have gone in to declare what you want to include in your search. For those of you familiar with Google site search, this is just like logging into the um, uh, Google custom search admin UI and telling it, oh, I wanna include this domain, that domain. That's just what we do in, in the search.gov admin center. And just like Google, we'll discover the URLs on your website and then we'll pull data from them and stick it in our indexes along with the content from other agencies. 
we leverage your sitemaps, and we crawl if needed, and we honor your robots.txt settings. So here comes Allison. And she has she wants to check on the status of her application. She knows what agency she's dealing with. So she goes right to their website and uses the search box on that website to find uh, to and types in application status. So the difference between now and when she was searching Google for passport application info is that the agency whose site she's searching works with us and has used our admin center to set up a search configuration that will target only the relevant content from our big index. So the query gets passed to us from the website. We process the query according to the search settings they've put in place, show her a page of results, and then she selects the status check tool and is brought back to the agency's website to get her status. So the relationship between sitemaps and your search configurations is minimal. The sitemaps support indexing, and they'll con they will inform what is in the index to be able to search it. But then the admin center settings control what exactly a person is going to be searching against when they use your search box. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So how, did we get any questions, or do we want to take a moment to let people type some in? We do have a question, Don. OK, great. So David Kaufman from GSA is asking, would you use no index yes follow for parent navigation pages that link to children but don't have content themselves? Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly the case where if you've got, a, if you've got anything that is solely a navigational element, meant to help people find their way through your site that would have a no index follow setting. And it's not yes follow, it's just follow. But yeah, very good. No further questions at this point. All right. Well, so I covered a lot in the session. We have, uh, we talked about search engines, discovering URLs and parsing them into their indexes. We talked about sitemaps and robots.txt. We talked about indexing and search being flip sides of the same coin. So if you have any questions that come up in the next while, of course, reach out. You know where to find us. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much.